Okay, everyone, we're going to try a new format this week. Let us let me know how, how it goes. This week we're going to be talking about research. Oh, yes, the exciting world of research. We're just going to cover the basics, so it's going to be a crash course. Those of you who have done this kind of thing before, um, this shouldn't be... This shouldn't be uh, too hard for you. However, I would encourage you, if you have any difficulties or, or if there's anything you understand, uh, don't understand at the end, please let me know. Let's talk about it. Um, there will be a little mini quiz at the end that we'll do, which hopefully will help you um, recognize if you understand it as well as you hope to. Okay. So first of all, I just kind of think this is a funny way to start. Um, if you are familiar with Calvin and Hobbes, I love them. Um, but this is Calvin's parents walking out and saying, I think we better get that kid to a psychologist. Right, because all the all the snowmen are looking at a snowman victim who got hit by the car, right? So this is a little bit of research they're doing, right? They're looking at something and going, hmm, I'm drawing a conclusion from here. I'm drawing a conclusion from this. That this is not normal and maybe maybe our kidneys help. Okay. So these are some paintings that I, we're gonna start with. Um these, I know it doesn't seem like, what does it have to do with research? Yeah. Um, so this is Madonna and Child, right? And this is a picture of a, of a, of a building. So kind of interesting buildings. Um, you know, just kind of think about like what the person who painted these might have been like. Um, yeah, I mean, little flowers and nice light over here. Beautiful fields back here, right? And this is a little bit darker and some trees. There's a little, little kind of village, right? So just kind of think about what the kind of person might be. Well, these these pictures were actually painted by the same person, and it is somebody that you have all heard of. Yeah, they were both painted by Hitler, a very famous man who um, exterminated millions of Jews through horrible, horrible execution. So we look at those paintings, and we think, how how did these paintings? How were they created by this by the same man? And one of the things that we can do <laughs> is we can break things apart. So not at all to say that people can be boiled down to a list, but when we look at when we look at different factors in his life, we're going to spend just a second, we can see that hmm, there might have been some things that could have indicated early on a problem that maybe could have been addressed. So he was born to a man uh, who was born out of wedlock. So his father was an illegitimate child, meaning his mother and father were not married when he, when he was born. Um, Hitler desired to be an artist, but he fought with his father a lot about his career choice. When Hitler was 11, his younger brother died. His father and his family wanted him to work in the civil service, but of course he wanted to be a, an artist. He moved to Vienna after his mother's death, and he failed to gain admittance to art school, so he really deeply experienced failure about something that was very important to him. Um, for five years, he struggled to survive, uh, living like the, the YMCA and other things. Um, political movements, including anti-Semitism, so anti-Semitism, of course, is um, you know, hating Jews, being uh, anti-Jewish people. Um, so he got involved with some of those political movements in Vienna. And in 1933, he led the National Socialist German Workers' Party. And in 1933, Nazi was the only legal political party in Germany. So, of course, the National Socialists, we're far more commonly think of them as Nazis, was the only legal party in Germany. So this is a very, very, very little sketch of, of his life. And one of the things I always think is interesting is to look at this and to think, okay, what things could we have seen about his life that could have maybe indicated that a problem was coming? Now, whether or not anything here could indicate a problem as great as, you know, almost ripping the world apart in the 20th century, you know, I think maybe not. But there are some things that we can see that go, okay, that, I can see how that would lead to difficulty. Okay, I can see how that would lead to rebellion. Okay, right? So this is a very, very informal way to do research. And this is also uh, one of the ways in which I think it's very interesting to see kind of how psychology and research can go together. And uh, another reason I start with this is to show that research is, people like to think of research as being an exact science, but something that's very important to remember is that research is largely determined by the researcher. The researcher gets to set the parameters on what's an outlier, what's not an outlier. The researcher, um, if they're unethical, they can eliminate data sets. Uh, and no one would even know that those data sets are eliminated unless they were partaking in the research. So research could come out and conclusively say something, or, you know, um, 
seemingly conclusively say something and really it could just because the researcher manipulated the information and manipulating the information doesn't even have to mean lying what it could just mean is that they set their parameters differently so it's very important to have um, a, a real understanding of what research can and cannot tell us and you'll never hear me say research proves I'll say research indicates because research can't really prove anything research can indicate things um, and it's very important to know what it can and can't indicate and again, like I said, it's very important also to take research with a grain of salt. Okay, so here's another picture of, a, of another guy um, thinking about who people are and how they get to be where they are. So this may be a face that's not very familiar to a lot of you, but I'm going to guess that his story is familiar to a lot of you. So this is the man that cut off his own arm because he was trapped, right, in order to get out of um, uh, an accident that he'd been in when he was mountain climbing. He cut off his arm, own arm and survived and got help. And this is the, <laughs> the arm that he got in, re in replacement. So here's another example of, uh, of a man who did something extraordinary, a very different kind of extraordinary, right? Um, and looking back on his life and what different factors were involved in that. And we're not going to get into his life as much as we did Hitler's. But again, it's one of those things. You can look at somebody and you can see that they did something extraordinary. And you can then look back and say, okay, what indications were of them, were there of this, of this, this extraordinary uh, behaviors? But it's not going to be absolute. Right? We can't always predict these things. In fact, usually we can't. So research, especially when we're talking about psychological research, I would say all research, all research, but re but for, for our purposes, we're especially talking about psychological research, it really needs to kept, be kept in mind that we're dealing with so many different factors that it is not black and white. Okay. So the basics of research. Now that we've talked a little bit what, what it can and can't give us. So research methods. There is descriptive and, the, and there, I'm going to talk about other kinds. But, so descriptive has three categories. There's observation, there's the case study, and there's survey. We've probably all taken surveys. Um, probably not many of us have been under observation, but maybe like if you've ever done a sleep study or something, you have participated in observation. And then case study. Case study is when one person out of a group or one small specific group is chosen to follow. So like a, a case study on an Olympian or something for instance uh, you know exploring their their greatness we just did two little bitty case studies right on on um, two different men right those are we just looked at them we obviously didn't do a lot of uh, re research into them but we looked at one you know the specific unusual cases okay so then you've got experimental too right so again you've got right descriptive and experimental. So experimental is when you start messing with variables. A lot of times people think about this as being this is research and the other stuff isn't research. But I, I would encourage you to it's not it's not as simple as that, um, because there are some things, a lot of things that you can't change the variables of. So an independent variable is a thing that you change. A dependent a dependent variable is a thing that you observe, and the controlled variable is a thing that you kept this the same. So the dependent variable is usually the thing that you're after. Um, or sorry, the independent variable is the thing you're, you're wanting to know about change, but the independent variable is the thing that you're, you're wanting to learn more about usually. So for instance, if we wanted to see um, which cookie helps people get better grades on tests, and again, I'm not saying it's a valid test, it's just what we're going to use as an example. Um, so you have three uh, different classes of psychology students, and you divide them up into groups, and you give one group macadamia nut cookies, one group uh, chocolate chip cookies, and one group sugar cookies right before our test. And you then add up their scores and, um, and divide them to see which group scored the highest. So the independent variable is the cookie. The dependent variable is the, the test score. And the control variable would be they're all psychology students at the same college in the same classroom taking the same test. Okay, so these are just little different examples. So um, this is would be an example example of observation. Uh, okay, which one of us do you think is getting the placebos? This would be an example of an experiment, right? There's some, there's obviously a controlled variable, uh, and then this example of a survey. Calvin says I'm filling out a re reader survey for Chewy magazine. See, they asked how much money I spent on gum each week, so I wrote five hundred dollars. For my age, I put forty three, and when they asked what my favorite flavor is, I wrote garlic slash curry. 
the magazine should have some amusing ads soon. And he says, I love messing with data. So this is actually also a wonderful example of why surveys are not always the most reliable because people get to say whatever they want to say. And there might be some people out there like Calvin who love to mess with data. Not going to give you real information, they just like to mess with the data. Okay. So this is scatter plots and correlation. We're not going to talk too much about this because this is not super important. What I just want you guys to recognize is this is an example of a strong positive correlation. A, co a co positive correlation means as one increases, the other increases as well. So if we're looking at the amount of trips somebody takes to McDonald's a week and the um, how many inches around their waistline is, we're probably going to see as one increases, the other increases as well, right? So that would probably be a strong positive correlation. This would be a weak positive correlation. See, there's generally a trend, right? But it's pretty weak. It's not really strong. The dots are not all connected really well. They're all kind of all over. These, the dots are all really following the same trajectory. This is a strong negative correlation, meaning as one decreases, as one increases, the other decreases. So for instance, the amount of time somebody spends studying and the amount of fights somebody gets in. We might see uh, the more times people study, the less time or the less, the fewer fights they get in, right? As one increases, the other decreases. So that would be an example of a strong negative correlation. This is an example of a weak negative correlation. See how they're generally following that trajectory, but it's much, they're not as tightly grouped around this line. It's much weaker. This is a moder moderate negative correlation. It's showing as a pretty good indication, but again, still not as tightly grouped. And then look at this randomness right here. This is what we would say there's no correlation. They don't seem to have any relationship. One variable doesn't seem to have any impact at all on the other variable. So something that you want to know for uh, tests is, this is hint, hint, is a correlation gets stronger as it approaches one. Whether it be positive one or negative one, it doesn't matter, as it approaches one. The closer it gets to zero, the weaker it gets. So a, a correlation that, that is negative 0.98 is much, much, much stronger than a correlation that is point, positive 0.45, right? The negative 0.98 is much stronger. So it gets stronger the further it is from zero. Zero is the middle. Okay, three measures of central tendency. You guys are probably all familiar with this. Covered this like in first grade, so I won't spend much time here, but there's mean, median, and mode. The mean is when you add everything. We've got six scores. You're wanting to see how, how generally how well students did on six tests um, or how well six students did on one test. So you add up their... their um, their scores divided by six, that gets you the, the mean. The median, the median is just the, the one in the middle, right? That's just so you, you line up the six scores and there's gonna be two in the middle, so those would be, and then you, what you do is you'd add those together and divide them and the mean would become the median. Let's say you had seven, okay, so you could actually have one. Whichever one is in the middle would just become your median. And then mode, mode is the one that's most common. So you're looking at those same, um, same test scores and the test scores were 70, 75, 80, 80, 91, 99. Well, there are two 80s, so 80 is your mode. And central tendency, right, what, your, what central tendency can tell us is, it, is it's a way to quickly uh, describe a large quantity of data. Um, so for instance, we have, um, you know, the average income uh, earned for, by people in the state of Alaska. And let's say that that average income is 100, $100,000. Well, it doesn't mean that everybody earns $100,000. Some people earn more, some people earn less, but it would be impossible to list the income that everybody in Alaska makes. So what we do is we come up with one measure of central tendency, very often mean is what's used, and we say, okay, this is the average. Okay. So bell curve, super cool thing about bell curve is most information can be plotted out and when it's plotted out, it will naturally form a bell curve. That is super cool. I think that's awesome. Um, it's not always true, but it's true most of the time. And so what that means forming a bell curve is that when you lay out all the data, so let's say that this was the, the test scores of a, t of a class of 80 and then you just lay out the test scores, right? So what you're gonna generally have is with, the, so this is the, um, the standard, so, so in, in this example, 100 is the average score, and it's got a standard deviation, we can see of 15 points. See how there's 15 points difference between 100 and every one of these marks that has 15 points difference. So that would mean the standard deviation is 15. So, um, and this is true for all standard um, bell curves. 
and um, that for this uh, group of 80 students we we're talking about 68 percent of the students in this class are gonna their score is gonna fall within one and two standard deviations of the of the mean so within one standard deviation above and within one standard deviation below the the mean so this means that 68 percent of the, of the students in the class will score between an 85 and 115 that's what this that's what they would tell us given those numbers All right everything that everything that's a standard bell curve looks like this but some of these numbers might be different um, and then once you get three standard deviations out of the standard mean that's what we start to call outliers so anybody that earned more than 145 or less than 55 would be an outlier if 100 was the mean um, so those are things that they tell us right um, and again this is this would be a standard bell curve so again that might be something that you want to know for a test hint hint is if if asked you know within um one uh, positive one and negative one standard deviation of the mean in a, a standard bell curve what what percentage will be represented the answer is 68 percent will be represented okay so these are curves marissa they're not all bell curves so these would be skewed ones so these are when the the mean median and mode don't all actually line up so they, they skew a little bit okay so we're going to just look really quick about what research can actually tell us. Remember I told you a little bit early, be skeptical. Be a little skeptical about research. Okay, so here are just a couple things to consider. We're going to cover these pretty quickly because um, I think that they're important just as we start out and we're looking at research. I don't want you guys to get too bogged down in them if you're not interested in research or if it just is confusing, but they're important things to know, generally speaking, um, especially because it's very easy to mislead people with research. Very, very easy. Okay, so the first question to ask when you're looking at research is follow the money, right? Who is paying for the research? Surprise, surprise, if somebody's paying for the research and the research makes them look good, mm, you know, maybe you should be a little skeptical about research, right? Um, I remember in 2008, Climate Gate. I don't know if you guys remember this. Some of you might be too young, uh, but a lot of researchers were being paid by organizations um, that were big proponents of global warming, and they were being paid these huge grants to prove that global warming was happening. Um, and it came out it, that all, they were all falsifying their data. Well, surprise, surprise, they were getting paid grants they're they're getting paid like that's what they were living off of they, they were getting paid um grants by an organization to show that something was happening do you think they would have stayed on very long if their research had shown that something wasn't happening um so they were fabricating their research so that the people paying their grant would continue to be happy and it was shortly after that, that people stopped saying global warming and they started saying climate change um you know of course the climate's always changing I mean, in the 60s it was um global cooling you know everybody was everybody's afraid of global cooling uh, and then in around 2000 it was global warming and now they're not taking a stance at all it's just climate change now so again it's one of those things look at the research look at who's paying for the research and are the people who are paying for the research making a lot of money <laughs> on it um, and then what is the N? So the N is the number of subjects involved in the data. I was reading um, an interesting piece uh, of uh, research the other day. I thought it was very interesting about um, relationships with, with dogs. And the N was like nine people and their dogs. I was like, eh, nine? That's like meaningless. That's such a small percentage um, that, it's, that it's essentially meaningless to, if you, to pull data from such a small, small population. Uh, unless it was like a really specific population under really specific circumstances, which it was not. What is a significant level is what that should say. So significant levels, significance levels can be set. They are set by the researcher. They are uh, the p-value, they're 0 0.001, 0 0.01, 0 0.05, 0 0.005. You can pick, um, those are the standard ones. But um, one of the reasons I just tell people this is that sometimes people say like um, something is shown to not be significantly, um, to, to, you know, to not, you know, have a, to not be statist statistically significant. But the thing people don't think about a lot is, well, what does statistically significant mean? Who decided what was statistically significant? 
And it's the researcher <laughs> who gets to decide what is statistically significant. So somebody could genuinely find a result and the, the p-value they set earlier, the significance value they set earlier, could show that the result was not significant. And then they could be like, oh, but I want my research to show that it's significant. And then they could change their p-value and all of a sudden it would be significant. So just be skeptical. Uh, you know, again, I'm not saying there's not good research out there. There is. But um, there, it's, it's really easy to do bad research. And it's easy to do bad research even unintentionally. People who are thinking that what they're doing is clarifying their research and what they're really doing is just making their research say what they want to say and they're kind of misleading themselves about how maybe honest their intentions are. And then they can also just be doing it sloppily, right? I mean, like people might be totally honest, they're just doing sloppy research. Um, what are the operational definitions? It's very important that that is included in research and a lot of times it is not. So if you're talking about like, um, you know, they're, you know, you're looking at a study that is a, um, different ways of dealing with pain and one party goes to church and one party does meditation and one party does baking. Well, and then you look at the effects of pain a week later or something like that, how they rate their pain levels. Okay, well, what does going to church mean? What does doing yoga mean? What does doing baking mean? Right, those, those operational definitions need to be pretty strictly defined, right? Uh, and then confounding variables. <laughs> Are there some, some variables that could potentially change things pretty dramatically and they weren't mentioned in the research? So for example, if you're doing an uh, experiment on, um, on anxiety, right? And um, maybe you started your research experiment, um, you know, like January 2020. Um, you might have seen a drastic and amazing increase in your um, population's anxiety. Uh, but it might not have had anything to do with what you were researching, right? I mean, can we, th can we think of something else that it could have had something to do with? Um, and then especially like maybe, you know, some of your um, uh, people participating in your study, they were really big into social media and their, their anxiety really increased and people who weren't as into social media and kept, you know, in, t in contact with people, their anxiety decreased. Well, could there be other variables? you know, besides maybe the medication that you're testing, right? <laughs> we, might, we might be seeing a confounding variable there. And it's important to know about that. And it's also important for that to be transparent in the research that you read. So be very, be very cautious with the research you read. I read a study the other day that said, that was trying to indicate that something was, um, that something was safe. And it said, several people have experienced this. And I was like, Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> you're trying to convince me that something is safe and you're not going to give me specific numbers. You're not going to give me a specific timeline. You're going to say several people in the last few weeks. Well, uh, no, 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 right? If you're trying to convince me of something, give me data, right? Say five people in the last three weeks, right? I mean, give me specific data. So whenever people are really inexact, that to me is a little red flag. Why aren't you giving me really specific data? Okay, so those are just a couple things for you guys to keep in mind. We're going to do a quick test to see if you guys uh, followed that all, as well as hopefully you think you did. Okay, so the first question is, what is the independent variable? I'm gonna give you five options. You don't normally get options in my class on tests, but for this one you will. What is the independent variable? Is it the factor that you're specifically changing or manipulating? Is it the factor that you're trying to impact indirectly? Is it the factor you're keeping the same across all experiments? The factor you're trying to eliminate? Or the factor you can't really define? So think about this, even pause this video for a second, think about it. Really make yourself come up with one answer. If you said it's the one you're specifically changing or manipulating, A, you're correct. One standard deviation to the right of the center of a bell curve would yield what percentage of the respondent scores assuming a normal distribution? Is it 74, 67, 34, 25, 50? So again, remember, one standard deviation to the right. If you said C, 34, you're correct. Which of the following is not, strictly speaking, a measure of central tendency? Mean, average, mode, or median? If you said B, average, you're correct. Now, very, very often when people say average, they, what they are saying by that is mean. However, that's not the word that's used in research. Which of the following would be the strongest correlation? 0 0.6, negative 0 0.25, 0 0.78, negative 0.81, or 0.1? 
If you said D, negative 0.83, you are correct. Because remember, it's whichever one is closest to one, either plus or minus, and furthest from zero, and that is negative 0.83. The last one is, the N tells you how strong the experiment is, how many subjects participated in the research, what procedure was used in the research, how many researchers participated in the research, or how reliable the results are. If you said B, how many subjects participated in the research, you are correct. Good job. So if you got all five of these right, awesome. If you missed any of them, I encourage you to go back and watch that little bit. If you're still confused, let's talk about it. I want to help you guys understand this as much as possible. Research is going to be foundational for everything else we do for the rest of the semester.